Good morning. This is Ron. It is Thursday, August the 2nd. Welcome to Storytime. And thank you very much. And this is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America, because I'm the only one that makes the presumption for the status quo. Speaking to all of you uh, butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. And uh, so uh, as, m- as much as I don't like the left and I hate socialism, uh, don't blame socialists for socialism or socialist, uh, the prevalence of socialism. Let's put it that way. Uh, blame the right. Blame Rush. Blame Sean. Blame the uh, Speaker of the House. Blame the uh, Leader of the Senate. Uh, blame uh, people like that. Uh, the former Speaker of the House of Representatives because they they do so many silly, unthinking, just stupid things to aid and abet the left that it's ridiculous. And one of the things that they do consistently is promote, literally promote uh, the left or uh, the left's surrogates. For instance, uh, yesterday I was uh, listening to the radio and there was a clip of uh, the former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, who was, um, he's out, he wrote a book. So usually when somebody sells a book, they go around to various different radio and television shows and uh, promote their book. And so he apparently went to CNN, of all people, to promote his book. And he was being asked a series of awkward questions about President Trump. Gee, what a surprise. What a surprise that CNN, of all people, would take the opportunity of having um, Newt Gingrich uh, on their show to ask him awkward questions about uh, Donald Trump. And uh, he did a, a half-assed job of, uh, of uh, defending the president, uh, which he wasn't there to do anyways. He's there to, to uh, hawk his book. But the point is that in so doing, he helps CNN. Uh, he is... I mean, I don't understand why he would bother, his agent would bother to book him on CNN in the first place when they have such low ratings, 100,000 people or something like that. So uh, why bother to do it just from a financial standpoint? It doesn't make much sense. I'd understand if uh, CNN was, if it was NBC, CBS, ABC, you know, which have a tendency to be just as left wing as CNN, but at least they have an audience. Um, And uh, so, but he goes ahead and goes on there anyhow, uh, and... This was a, a clip that was put on Sean Hannity's show. So it's a double whammy. CNN gets uh, two for the price of one. They get uh, the attention from uh, Newt Gingrich, people like Newt Gingrich, who are going to tune in and give them some extra ratings ostensibly uh, to because they're going to want to watch uh, Newt Gingrich. And uh, Sean Hannity's audience uh, gets uh, some, they get some free advertising on Sean Hannity's show. CNN does. So, and it just, uh, it's infuriating. Uh, Rush Limbaugh does it all the time, where he will uh, play a clip of something somebody said on MSNBC, sometimes about him, and that's quasi-understandable, you know, uh, that uh, if it's about him, then he might go ahead and play the clip and um, then go ahead and um, respond to it. But uh, he does it, uh, if they... A lot of times when it's uh, not about him, it's about the president or it's about somebody else. No, don't do this. Uh, you're Again, you're giving them uh, free advertising, uh, you know, if nothing else. And uh, in trying, uh, helping them to pump up their ratings and uh, just giving them free advertising. And it's uh, not necessary and just absolutely uh, stupid. And uh, that's, again, what, basically what the theme of my show is, that it is the mistakes of the conservatives, the ignorance and the stupidity of conservatives that have uh, put uh, the country in the, in the place that it is where, um, and, and make no mistake, if you look at the election maps, uh, the, the socialists in this country are in no great shape, um, electoral uh, uh, election wise okay so uh if you look at the 2016 election map done, drawn out by counties there's very very few uh, counties that uh voted uh that are blue the vast majority are uh red but the point is that uh, look at the cultural effects that are um that the left is still able to have small 
and um, in the, the larger scheme of things rather insignificant, but it's still there and it shouldn't be. And it's gotten to this point because not just because of mistakes that have been made over the past couple of weeks or couple of years, um, I suppose I could understand that, but these are mistakes that have been going on for decades. Again, uh, you would have, uh, uh, like I've mentioned before, William F. Buckley Jr. inviting uh, left lefties on his show, uh, not uh, to uh, defeat them or show how they're uh, stupid or wrong or bad or whatever, but basically it just seemed like he was giving them a platform uh, on which to promote themselves. And uh, in so doing, uh, promoting their ideology, promoting their leftist agenda. And uh, it was Robert Novak. He was a reporter, and um, he passed away a few years ago. But he said something that really depressed me a few years ago uh, before, he, before he passed away, naturally, where he said that the Republicans in Washington have no interest in uh, the Republican agenda, conservative agenda, or any agenda, for that matter, other than getting rich. That that's the only reason that they're there, is to get rich. And it was absolutely depressing, because I, uh, my, I voted in the first election I voted in 1980. I voted for Ronald Reagan and the vote of the straight Republican ticket. And um, so and I was very uh, disappointed to find that uh, the Republicans very often uh, did whatever. They did a, a better job of trying to thwart... Uh, the efforts of Ronald Reagan than did uh, a lot of the Democrats. So, uh, but anyway, so the more I look at Washington, D.C. and the way that uh, Republicans behave, the more w what Mr. Novak said makes sense to me. Where, um, because you're thinking if you're not going to go in there and promote conservatism or republicanism, then why are you there? It's got to be for the money. And you see that a lot where, uh, a person will be get into Congress and they'll be uh, broke when they enter Congress and multimillionaires when they leave. And then those people that already have money become even wealthier. They become tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm waiting to have uh, somebody in Congress that's the first uh, uh, billionaire, congressional billionaire. But uh, so, Again, if you're, you know, you're frustrated and you're upset with socialism, look at the Republicans. It is the Republicans that help to, uh, through their ineptness, their incompetence, their stupidity, uh, they, that they help to uh, promote uh, the left, and they shouldn't be doing it. So look to uh, uh, Rush Limbaugh and Sean Hannity and whatnot, and you'll see, again, that they're going to... Uh, and then they, they want to be friends with a lot of the people on the left, or at least pretend they're friends. They can't actually, you can't be friends with somebody that's diametrically opposed to everything you stand for. So, um, again, the Republicans and conservatives need to uh, get off the dime, quit promoting socialism. It's just that simple. Simply quit promoting socialism and uh, the effects on this our society by socialists will diminish significantly. Okay, when I come back, uh, I'm going to be reading from the uh, 1993 interview um, of Rush Limbaugh by Playboy magazine. Thank you very much. And uh, in Play, Playboy magazine interviewed Rush Limbaugh in 1993, and that was just, uh, well, four years, I guess. Well, I think he started in 88. I first became aware of Rush Limbaugh in 1989 when I came back. I was stationed in Germany for three years, 86 to 89, and I came back in September of 89 and was stationed in San Antonio, Texas. And that's the first time I ever heard of Rush Limbaugh. And I've been listening to him pretty steady uh, ever since. So about four years after that, that's when this uh, interview took place with uh, Playboy magazine. Now, I've been reading this interview and um, where we, they've been starting to get into some personal things with Rush Limbaugh, his married life and that kind of thing. So there's a whole section on that and I've skipped it because it's irrelevant to uh, my points here. And, uh, that, and, and the point of this is that you can learn a whole lot about how the left operates, the little tactics and techniques that they use by reading interviews, by seeing how they interview or listening to interviews, whether it's a television or, or on the radio. So 
Um, now, there's a little uh, part here. Okay, they, they basically finished the interview by, you know, uh, speaking to him about his all his personal his personal life and whatnot. Uh, now they have this little uh, I, item in italics. Congress passed President Clinton's budget plan after our initial interviews. We wanted to ask Limbaugh about that and to follow up on questions asked in the earlier sessions. Although Limbaugh's representatives had originally agreed to this final session, they now balked. And it was only with considerable negotiating that Mano, the interviewer, was uh, permitted to meet again with Limbaugh. Playboy, thank you for giving us this time. We know how busy you are, and we have just a few questions for you. Limbaugh, I want it on the record, by the way, that I resent this follow-up. I don't have to justify what I think to anybody at Playboy. I don't think, uh, I don't know who asked you to come back, but they're probably not satisfied because it doesn't make me look bad enough in some idiot's eyes at the editorial board. And so a quick comment here is, again, he, he finally starts to get it. He didn't get it in the initial interview, and it took a little while afterwards before he starts to wake up and realize that the whole purpose of the interview was uh, is to try to do things to make him uh, look weak, to look bad, uh, and um, it, they had uh, some success in that because, again, he missed a lot of things. But uh, he finally starts to wake up to that. But then again, why would you go back to Playboy? Why would you agree? to sit down with them again. Once you've woken up to the fact that the only purpose for this interview is to uh, humiliate you and make you look bad, uh, why would you agree to a second one? It doesn't make any sense. So, Playboy, okay, one issue we didn't touch on er in our earlier sessions is the welfare problem. Is welfare really the evil that you and other conservatives paint it? Okay, so this question is, uh, on at first, seems to be a fairly legitimate, straightforward question, because he asks, is it uh, the evil? But the problem is there's a presumption there. There's a presumption that uh, Rush Limbaugh and conservatives have painted as evil. Uh, and again, they don't produce any proof. It's an arbitrary claim, in other words. So what you need to do is deny it or put them in a position to prove it. So uh, one of the things that you, ways you can do that is by simply denying it. Uh, I'm sorry, but I've never painted welfare as evil, nor has any other Republican. Next question. Okay, now the individual is going to have to be in a position where they either have to put up or shut up, prove that, they're, that uh, I called it evil, or uh, let's go on and move on to the next question. Uh, but... Limbaugh, certainly, it is bankrupting the nation. Defense isn't bankrupting the nation. Welfare payments to people who are otherwise capable are bankrupting the nation. Here's a recent example. California Governor Pete Wilson has suggested that Californians simply cannot afford to pay for the health care, general welfare, and education for illegal aliens. But then representatives of the illegal aliens responded, that's un-American. That's where we've gone wrong. The definition of American is to take the money produced by hardworking, risk-taking Americans and give it to illegal immigrants who come here to sponge. Illegal aliens, then, when we want to pull back on it because we can't afford it anymore, it's called un-American. This is a clear example of how the welfare state has gone totally wrong. Welfare states have failed around the world, the Soviet Union, Western Europe, Germany, Sweden, London, Paris. They're going down the tubes. They're in horrible shape because the dream doesn't work. The utopia can't exist. We're headed down the same path, and the American people know it. Now, on his question or his answer here, uh, at the end, he recognizes and does point out that there's no paradise. No paradise for you. No paradise for you. Um, there's, there's not going to be any socialist, no paradise, socialist or otherwise. It's not going to be a conservative paradise, a libertarian paradise, none of that. Uh, but in the beginning, what he's doing here, when he's uh, justifying the fact of his his uh, describing, which he's now admitted to, by the way, he, by by the answering the question, he admits that he considers welfare to be evil. Um, I, I don't think that's a wise thing to do, and I don't th I believe that it's true. I don't think he ever characterized it as evil, wrong, but not evil. But in so in trying to back up this claim, what he's doing is making a pragmatic response. He's response, uh, responding pragmatically. He's talking about how 
uh, the, the facts and the figures of it. Let's see here. Uh, it's bankrupting the nation. Uh, that uh, the governor of the state of California has said we cannot afford to do X, Y, Z. The problem with making a pragmatic objection is that you will always get from your opponents, from the left, a pragmatic answer to your pragmatic objection. Okay. So in this particular case, the pragmatic objection is about money. We can't afford it. Okay. That's what he's saying is the basis of his objection to um, the welfare uh, system. If I'm on the left, then I say, well, you're probably right. We can't afford it. So you know what? We're going to raise taxes. We're going to go ahead and raise taxes on the wealthy. We're going to go ahead and raise taxes on booze. We're going to raise taxes on cigarettes. Now, what do you do? Now you're Rush Limbaugh and somebody has proposed a solution to your problem. What are you going to do? Are you going to say, oh, okay. In that case, I support welfare. Right. Because isn't that what he's implying? He doesn't support it because it's financially irresponsible. But if we could make it somehow financially responsible, he would support it. And so it's a weak, incredibly weak argument. Once they come out and say, let's raise taxes, he has no choice but to agree with it. Not only agree to raise taxes, but then to agree to uh, support welfare. Or he looks like an ideologue. Somebody that is objecting to things simply be uh, uh, gratuitously objecting to it simply for the uh, for the sake of objecting, making an objection uh, that he is uh, wants to deny people welfare simply because he hates poor people or he hates brown people or black people or whatever. OK, the substantive argument, the main argument he needs to make in this uh, it, about welfare or anything else, it has to be principled. You have to be able to say, number one, in in this kind of a situation where you're dealing with the law, is you got to be able to say it's unconstitutional. That's your best argument. Hey, we welfare's out not because it's evil, but because it's unconstitutional, and make make your argument as to why it's unconstitutional. Because if you can make a successful argument that it's unconstitutional, the left can't argue with you. They can't come back. That's not a pragmatic argument. They can't come up with a pragmatic solution to that. Another way also is, and that's as good or better, is making the moral or ethical argument. In this country, it used to be that we considered idle hands to be the devil's workshop. Because basically what welfare is doing is paying you to do nothing. And uh, part of the problem that we have in this country is a culture that no longer respects productivity. It used to be in our country, you, you worked because you wanted to be productive. It wasn't in strictly about the money. Yes, you needed money to pay for groceries and pay the rent. But there was also a spiritual, psychological, and cultural component to work. You work because you need to be productive. And uh, welfare goes the opposite direction says you don't need to, to be productive. Uh, we will pay you to be unproductive. Just as bad as uh, I've heard of farmers that get paid not to grow. If there's a glut of corn on the market, some farmers actually get paid by the government not to grow corn. So um, just as wrong as having a welfare system which is saying to the average individual, you don't need to be productive. Don't bother we will pay you to be unproductive. And that comes from this idea in our society of getting things for free, getting something for nothing, which again, used to be uh, the average American wouldn't accept that. You wouldn't accept something for nothing because they believe, believed and knew there is no such thing as a free lunch. But uh, the, because of the left's influence in our culture, that went away and was replaced by the idea of you're an idiot if you don't accept something for free. OK, so that's where we get back. In, that's the whole idea of being productive uh, goes out the window and it becomes de rigueur to uh, try to get paid to do nothing. We have more and more and more of that in our society. And it's not just welfare, but the idea of having paid vacations instead of going to work. And saving your money, putting some of your own money aside 
to pay for a vacation, now you have vacation hours. So that when you go on vacation, you still get paid your salary. So what the company is doing is paying you not to work. Huh? And then uh, sick leave, where you're, again, you're paid not to work. What? Again, so, and that all comes from the idea that our values have changed in our society thanks to the left, or actually thanks to the idiocy of the people on the right. Our values have changed from the valuing productivity, valuing earning, that everything I have is earned, to valuing free, valuing getting something for nothing. There's also a moral component to getting something for nothing. What is another way of getting something for nothing? theft. So uh, why should I sit around and wait for the government to send me a check? Why don't I just go steal somebody else's? That's one of the things that does occur or used to. Uh, Now a lot of uh, checks are sent uh, uh, electronically into people's bank accounts. But when they were actually sending out checks, uh, a lot of bad guys would simply uh, um, hold up the uh, mailman. They mug the mailman, take all the welfare checks, and cash them themselves. Why not? If if our value is that uh, it is uh, better to get something for nothing than to be productive, then then aren't we not valuing um, illegal, immoral activities such as theft? Aren't we uh, on our way to becoming a criminal society and encouraging criminal activity? So uh, back to the interview. Uh, let me see. Uh, Playboy, in our original sessions, you said that President Clinton will do apocalyptic damage to the economy before he's through. Can you be more specific about that? Uh, Limbaugh, quote, be more specific about it, unquote. I think I've been as specific as anybody you've probably ever talked to about it. I'll be glad to update it, but I think it's bullshit to have to sit here because these are insulting questions. Everybody knows the answer to this. And, um, This is another thing where our culture has changed. It used to be people didn't ask stupid questions. Stupid questions are asked regularly now, and it's usually an issue of power. They'll ask the stupid questions to purposely put somebody on the spot, to make them squirm, to make them feel awkward, and uh, make them look nervous and whatnot. But it used to be that if somebody asked a stupid question, they'd be called on it. They say, no, I'm sorry, that's a stupid question, okay? Stupid questions being those kinds of questions that you either already know the answer to or you can figure out in short order. So, um, again, so he, everybody knows the answers to this. He, what he should have done is said, this is a stupid question. I'm not answering it. Uh, anyways, Limbaugh continues, the reason we're going to do uh, apocalyptic eco- economic damage is that we don't have a five-year plan. There's no such thing. It's not allowed by law. Every budget is a one-year budget. Then projections are made on the next four years based on the mistakes and projections in the current budget. So there's not one genuine budget cut in this one-year budget. They may be cutting defense a little, but we're making that back with loose spending in other areas. The budget's not getting smaller, is it? But who's getting taxed? The people who create jobs. In the past two years, small business has created 100% of the jobs while big business has laid people off. IBM, 100,000 here. Kodak, 10,000 over there. Apple, 2,000 here. Big corporations are downsizing, and they're not facing a tax increase. But small business is facing rising tax rates of from 31% to more than 42%. And in some states, if you factor in the state and local tax, you're paying more than 50%. Small business earnings, profits, are being eaten up in taxes. It's an all-out assault. And then... Not satisfied with that, we have to be retroactive to January 1st. You cannot tax the wealth-producing sector to this degree and have economic growth. It's just impossible. Now, the Clinton administration says, but wait, we're going to give you tax breaks if you invest in your small business. Or, if you start a new business and hold it for five years, we'll give you a big capital gains break. What they don't understand is, what are these people going to invest? Their profits and earnings are being taxed with these new rates. When confronted with that reality, the administration says, but wait, we've got interest rates down for you. Well, they have uh, done no such thing. Interest rates are down because the bond market is convinced there's not going to be any economic growth. 
Inflation drives interest rates, and inflation is low. We may be in a deflationary cycle. Interest rates have been plummeting for 24 months, long before Clinton ever got serious about running for president. Besides, who wants to borrow money in an economy like this? There's no confidence that you're going to be able to earn enough money to pay it back. And if you do earn enough, it's going to be taxed. So it's back to the uh, zero-sum game. Then they say, quote, look at the stock market. It's at an all-time high. They love our plan. They don't love the plan. They're scared to death. The reason that stock market is going up is that it's the best risk you can take right now in terms of return. The stock market has a long ago ceased to be an indicator of economic strength and activity. It set an all-time highs during the 1992 uh, recession that George Bush was in charge of. People are putting money there because it's the only place to go right now, and nobody's happy about it. And where's the party? How come 90% of the Democratic congressmen and senators who signed the budget bill didn't show up for the signing? And the ones who were there hid their faces behind pieces of paper because they didn't want to be seen anywhere near the signing of this bill. Nobody wanted this bill. It's a rotten bill. Anyways, he goes on uh, with this uh, for a little while, and I'm not going to continue with it, in part because what he's doing is contradicting himself here, because, again, in the beginning, he says everybody knows the answer to this, and then he spends uh, two or three more pages uh, going ahead and explaining uh, what he's apparently already explained in a previous in his previous uh, part one of his uh, interview. And again, if it's a stupid question, you leave it at that and ask for the next question. So um, at the end of his long, lengthy diatribe here, he says, now clean that up and make it understandable. Playboy, that was about as clean as anyone could make it. Limbaugh, you understood it, huh? Okay, good. Playboy, which leads us to our next question. You're an excellent showman. Is it possible that you use showmanship to sell what are actually pretty unattractive political points of view. So now, um, here again, now we start getting into the, uh, again, where they're attempting to make him look like a bad guy. And uh, he could have avoided this by simply saying, no, I'm not coming back for a second interview, but too late for that now. Um, Hopefully he's going to, we'll find out in a second whether or not he realizes that uh, what they're doing is, uh, you know, trying to screw him over here and and does or says something about at least call him out on it. So, um, but the uh, thing of the question says, you're an excellent showman. So the first thing to do is say, no, you're wrong. I'm not a showman. And then it says, uh, you're selling pretty unattractive political points of view. No, you're wrong about that too. You're wrong because I'm not selling anything. And number two, the points of view I'm selling are not unattractive. Okay, so it's just basically one large denial. You're wrong. Uh, But instead... Limbaugh, no, I am not coming forward with showmanship and articulating some foreign concept that a bunch of unthinking robots are being programmed to believe. I don't have that kind of power. Nobody in the media has that kind of power. The fact of the matter is I am a profound success because I relentlessly pursue the truth and I do so with the epitome of accuracy that sets me apart from mainstream journalists. Talk to my audience and without exception, they'll say, finally, there's a guy who says what I've always been thinking. But that has nothing to do with accuracy. And that is why he's popular, because he does say a lot of the things other people have been thinking about. He filled a void. There's no doubt about that. Uh, But that in and of itself doesn't mean that what he says is automatically accurate. I validate. I don't orchestrate, dictate, or otherwise cause people to ponder. I simply validate. And some people will uh, indeed listen and say, you know, I've always thought I was a liberal, but he says exactly what I think. People are not the blithering dunderheads that many in the dominant media culture, which oddly includes the editorial staff of Playboy, would like to believe they are. And that's why the media are obviously so threatened. And uh, again, so he takes uh, kind of a a little bit of a shot at uh, Playboy. But he could have also just simply summed it up by saying, your question is arbitrary and false. Next question. You know, and then if he if the interviewer wants to get into a little bit of a, a discussion, maybe about uh, why it's arbitrary or false, then you can quickly point that out. It's arbitrary because you haven't produced any evidence to back up your claims that I'm selling or I'm a showman or that there's unattractive points of view involved here. Next question. Say, so put if the left is going to win, that's fine. Let her, then they win. But make them earn it. Damn it, don't hand them the game. Don't turn it over to them. Okay, you're the quarterback, you take the snap, 
and then just throw it to the middle linebacker on the other side? No. Make them earn it. So if they make an arbitrary statement, you say it's an arbitrary statement. I'm not going to answer that. Okay? And then they either have the, the burden of coming up with some evidence and proof, or they dry up and blow away. That's it. So Playboy, a follow-up on race. It's uh, perceived by some that you are anti-minority, maybe even racist. Here again, another arbitrary statement. But because Rush Limbaugh doesn't know uh, or understand about arbitrary statements, etc., then he says, whoever thinks that is simply wrong, if they think I'm a racist or, what did you say? Anti-minority. Anti-minority, that's just wrong. It's untrue. I... Uh, I ask anybody with an open mind and intellectual honesty to listen to my radio show or watch my TV show. Listen to the blacks or other minorities and women who call my show and listen to the way they've been treated and the way they're portrayed. Uh, you'll find blacks on my show far less threatening and far better examples of the black population and mass than you will find on any other late night show, like Arsenio Hall's. I think the way blacks are portrayed on my show is far better than the way they're portrayed on his. And so he's fallen. He's taken the damn bait. They didn't, they didn't produce any evidence that he's anti-minority or racist. Okay? And that's what he needs to say. I'm sorry, your statement's arbitrary. I'm not going to answer it. And then he, they have the job of coming up with some evidence. Uh, and then, you know, they can say, well, you're racist. We, we have a picture of you in a KKK robe. Really? Can I see that? Now we can go somewhere with this. He can defend himself. Sorry, that's not me. Or I wasn't there when this picture was allegedly taken. It's a fraud. Whatever. But you now have something that you can uh, uh, to deal with. But an arbitrary statement is just ridiculous. You don't do it. And listening to a statement, all it sounds like every time you uh, try to um, answer an arbitrary claim, you sound like somebody with a guilty conscience or a guilty person that's trying to get away with something. Uh, he, he All he had to do, he came so close to saying, oh, no, no, I'm not a racist. All my friends are black. What? Um, so, and he says here, listen to the blacks or other minorities or women who call my show. Come on. You make it, it makes you sound like you're a misogynist. You're a, a redneck of some sort, a KKK Southern redneck uh, who's trying to get away with something. That's why, a good part of the reason why you don't deal with arbitrary statements. You say they're arbitrary, can't answer them. Next question. Playboy, but the perception that you're anti-minority. Limbaugh, those are just the musings of a liberal who has a prejudice about conservatism and assumes that conservative means anti-minority, exclusive majority, whatever. It's absolute nonsense, and it's a question, as I say, born of intellectual laziness and vapidity. Whoever came up with these questions should know they're irrelevant. Some people say you are this and you are that. Well, some people say that Playboy ought to be shut down too, but I don't think Playboy is going to spend a whole lot of time dealing with that. They have more important things to do because they have survived. They have a market. Same with me. Uh, and it has nothing to do with the market. This is, Playboy is smart enough to know arbitrary claims when he hears them. And they don't bother to respond. Okay? Because they know what it's going to do. It's All it's going to do is make your opponent look good, make you look bad. Stupidity. So, and it has nothing to do with marketing. What I am, and your guys have to understand this, is anti-liberal. I think liberalism is a scourge. It destroys the human spirit, destroys economies. And uh, so basically he just goes on and on um, making a fool out of himself because he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't understand the trick that they're playing on him. He's ignorant of it. He falls into the trap and makes himself look like an idiot. It's the analogy I always like to use is that the Democrats uh, have a grand dinner party, invite a whole bunch of people, including Republicans, but at all the Republican uh, place settings, there's no forks or spoons or knives. So the Republicans sit down, and instead of saying, wait a minute, I don't have any cutlery. I'm not going to attend this party unless somebody gets me some something to eat with. No, what they do instead, because they, they're thinking, Oh, well, I, I got to prove that I'm hip or cool, is they eat with their hands. And then they can't understand why everybody's snickering at them and calling them a, a, a troglodyte or a caveman, uh, maybe because you're acting like it. And then not only that, but then they go back again and again and again. Every time uh, a Democrat uh, party, uh, the Democrats have a party, the Republicans show up. Learn, learn something. 
So, um, <clears throat> and I'm opposed to them ideologically, but on no other basis do I feel bothered by them. Playboy, you told us in our, your, your first session that you made a lot of money. Do you mind telling us how you use it, say, to entertain yourself? No, I save it, almost 100% of it, in cases, in case places like Playboy actually drive me off the air. That way, I'll have a nest egg to rely on. And he gives Playboy way too much credit. The only reason that Playboy or any other lefty has any power is because morons like him give it to them. Quit giving them power. And they won't be able to drive you off the air. First of all. Second thing is, they don't want to drive you off the air. The Playboy isn't out filing lawsuits to try and get you uh, knocked off the air. What Playboy wants to do is just simply make you look like an idiot or actually give you, uh, trick you into making yourself look like an idiot. Then your audience goes down, your ratings go down, and then you just end up vanishing. Nobody will ever, you just sort of disappear because the, the Playboy knows that um, it is gauche to show up to a cocktail party with blood on your hands. You can't go around bragging about how you've gotten people fired. Nobody wants to hang around with you. Nobody wants to socialize with somebody that's in the habit <clears throat> of uh, getting people fired or getting them thrown off the air. So what they want to do is put you in a position where you screw yourself. You do something stupid. You say something stupid. You end up having to apologize. You end up having to resign, et cetera, et cetera. Then they can go to a cocktail party and stand around and say, isn't it? Sh what a shame about Rush Limbaugh. Wow. Well, you know, it's his own damn fault. If he'd had his head screwed on straight, it wouldn't have happened. That's the way they want to do it. Limbaugh, how would I answer the charge that the U.S. has turned from a lender to a borrower? I don't think it's a charge. It's a fact. Yet I have to uh, I have yet to assign any specific damage. Uh, excuse me. Let me go back to the question from Playboy. Um, all right, moving on. You said that during the Reagan era, people were proud to be American again and that to try to revise those years is a criminal act. But how do you answer the charge that under Reagan, the U.S. has turned from a lender to a borrower nation? And would you resolve the deficit? Uh, and how would you resolve the deficit challenge? So, again, it's an arbitrary uh, statement. <clears throat> it's an arbitrary statement. He needs to say it's arbitrary. Next question. But he doesn't. Uh, it's a, he says, how would I answer the charge that you has changed from being a lender to a borrower? I don't think it's a charge. It's a fact. I have yet to assign any specific damage that has resulted from it, sarcastically, but I have total confidence that Bill Clinton will fix it. As for resolving the deficit challenge, let me tell you what we need to do, and this could be quite lengthy. Our problem resides in the way we budget, and I'm not going to go through it because, again, he goes on for another two or three pages and figures and whatnot. I'm just going to go ahead and wrap this up for the time being. But that's the other problem with Rush Limbaugh. I'm listening to Rush Limbaugh because I want to know what do I say to the liberals in my life, right? When I get some liberals that come up to me and they want to brag about Bill Clinton or they want to brag about this or they want to denigrate somebody or a conservative of some sort, how do I respond to that? Rush Limbaugh has these long-winded answers that go on and on. Am I really supposed to tape this, memorize it, and then while I'm standing in line at the grocery store, regale this lefty with all of this stuff from Rush Limbaugh, blah, 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 you know, uh, 20,000 million quadrillion jobs, and you, on and on and on and on. No. You need to have, a, a when you're dealing with the left, a very succinct way of, of dealing with them, answering their questions. And usually it's very easy because they don't ask questions of any substance. They're always trying to make you feel guilty about something. They're always trying to get in your psyche. So very often it's as simple as asking them a question back. Hey, did you hear about this? Or what do you think about X, Y, Z? What do you think about the deficit? Well, you know what? I really hadn't thought about it. What should I think about the deficit? And when you say that, they'll choke every single time. Uh, another one would be in modern times, a little bit more up to date. Somebody might come up to you and say, hey, aren't you embarrassed about Donald Trump? I got the perfect answer for that if and when I get asked. And it's going to be, you know, what embarrasses me is watching Hillary Clinton's eyeball spinning counterclockwise in her head during an interview. 
What really embarrasses me is listening to Hillary Clinton spend 5, 10, 15 minutes coughing so much she can't complete a speech. What embarrasses me is watching Hillary Clinton getting picked up off of her feet and put in a van because she's too weak to climb in it. Thank God Hillary Clinton was not elected president. Okay, That's simple, succinct, to the point. Okay, And it's also not defensive. Turn that question around. That's the problem with using psychological tactics and techniques for the left. Is that you, you can use them on me. I can turn around and use them on you too. So, but that's going to conclude um, this uh, part of the Playboy interview. It goes on a little bit uh, longer, but uh, I'm kind of done with it for right now. And uh, we'll, it's going to go ahead and wrap up this particular episode of Storytime as well. And uh, so until next time, thank you very much for joining me and have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.